We're still in Exodus, and we're going to go to the fourth chapter. Exodus, the fourth chapter. This story, uh, this event actually began in chapter 3. We have chapter divisions and verse divisions for our benefit, but this is a continuation. Acts four, uh, excuse me, Exodus 4 is really just a continuation of Exodus 3. And so we're still at the moment on the backside of Midian where Moses is confronted by God in the bush that burned with fire and is not consumed. And everything in chapter 3 and chapter 4 is really the same conversation. And so we sometimes break it up that it's a different conversation but we're right here as God is still dealing with Moses and you know what's happening here let me refresh your memory a little bit Uh, Moses uh, has been now for 80 years 40 in Egypt and 40 in the desert uh, waiting and uh, now God is calling God is saying Moses it's time for you to go back to Egypt and to deliver the children of Israel to deliver your people to deliver my people and And Moses is really arguing with God. He's questioning God. He's uh, just kind of making sure. Now, what what are you saying? What's going on? And God is uh, reassuring him. He's reaffirming him. And uh, that's the conversation uh, that we're dealing with here. So let's begin in chapter number 4, verse 1. And uh, with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to go down to the fifth verse only. We'll come back next week, Lord willing, and pick up there. But I really want to get one thought this morning, one thought only. And it's a very simple thought. And I want you to see it with me as we look at verse number one. The Bible says, and Moses answered and said, but. Now, I don't know if you circle or underline in your Bible, but there's, there's some words that you need to see are important words. This is a small word, three letters, but God speaking, Moses is budding. God is speaking and Moses is budding. And what he's saying there is, Lord, I know what you said But, how many of you have ever said that to God before? I know what you say, I know what the Bible says, uh, but I've got a different idea. Uh, But I've got a problem. Uh, But I've got a question. But I, but, but, but. A lot of us need to be more sheep-like than goat-like, okay? Sheep follow goats, but. And so here's Moses, but, but. Stop giving God excuses, That's what's happening here. But, behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take up by the tail and he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee I want you to go to verse number two we draw our text and we draw our thought from the text and the verse here in chapter four verse two what is that in thine hand What is that in thine hand? Heavenly Father, a simple thought, but Lord, I believe one of the most important, one of the most important truths that the Christian will ever grasp is that you want to use us as we are right now. We don't need any more training we don't need any more ability we don't need any more of anything but you and you will use us as we are where we are for what you want us to do help us this morning to grasp a simple thought that could be a life-changing thought if we'd allow you Holy Spirit of God to drive this deep in our soul we ask now in Jesus name amen Moses, you keep saying but. You keep saying but. So I'm going to ask you a question. What is that in thine hand? Now Moses is what? By trade now for 40 years, what has Moses been doing? He's been a a what? About seven of you have been paying attention to this, all right? When I say Moses has been a, you're supposed to holler back. What does a shepherd have in his hand? 
a shepherd's staff. Now, this is not a shepherd's staff. This is a walking stick, but it's the best I could do. I'm not a shepherd. Shepherd's staff would have a long staff with a crook on the end, and it's used for twofold. One, you could take the, the bottom end and kind of guide the sheep, but number two, you would take the crook end and you'd be able to pull a sheep back. Maybe he's fallen into a ravine or a, a body of water, so you could reach down and get him, but it was a tool. It was just a common tool. It was a, it was a piece of wood, maybe a, a limb or a small tree they had to take down, and they would shape and form and smooth out, and, and it was nothing but a piece of wood that the common man would use to do a very common job, uh, in fact, a low-level job. Shepherds were not regarded as high-level people. In fact, for the Egyptian, the shepherd was despised because it was such a low-level thing. And, and so Moses is out there with his sheep and with his staff, and, and he's giving God all the reasons he can't, just like you and I do, all the reasons we can't do what God's called us to do. And God said, all right, Moses, what do you got? What's in your hand, man? He said, it's a stick, a staff, a rod. Throw it down. What? All right, throw it down. Snake. Now listen, you can be like the crocodile hunter if you want to be. You can be like those guys on National Geographic. I'm holding the world's most deadly snake in my hand. Now listen, you can be that guy if you want to. But if you do that, I believe you're mentally challenged. There's two kinds of snakes. There's a dead snake, and there's the rest of the snakes. Oh, don't touch that snake. It's a good snake, and there are good snakes. We, leave a, we actually have a snake that lives at our house, and uh, we leave him alone. He's out in our bushes, and every now and then you'll go take the trash out, and he'll surprise you, and I'll, I'll do things you didn't think this body could do. For about 20 seconds, I am a world champion sprinter. It's a black snake. It keeps the varmints down. We, we, we leave the snake alone. And there are good snakes, and we need good snakes. But never in my life have I gotten close to look at the rings on a snake to see if it's a red and yellow and black or whatever that pattern is. I don't care. Snake is a snake. I run. And Moses, you can tell he's a brilliant man because the rod becomes a snake. And the Bible says that he ran like a scalded dog. Now, that's in the Hebrew. You wouldn't know that. I have to show you that. Uh, he fled. He ran like a scalded dog. He took over and said, I don't want nothing to do with no snake. And then God said, pick it up by the tail. If you are one of those crocodile hunters, one of those snake people, you never pick a snake up by the tail. That snake can whip around and get you. You always try to slow its head down enough to where you get it right by the back. I would never know this because I'll never do this. But they say this and they show this on TV that you pick it up by the head so that you can control the venomous part. The tail won't hurt you. The head will. And God said, Moses, don't pick it up by the head. Pick it up by the tail. Now, Moses picked it up by the tail, and immediately that snake became a rod again. And he said, no, Moses, I'm going to show you that that simple rod, that stick in your hand, is going to be sign enough that you've met with the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of Joseph. I want to ask you this morning, it's a simple thought. There's nothing to it. What's in your hand? What do you got this morning? God is working. I, I, I'm, I'm sensing and, and I, I believe this with all my heart. And, and, and I was talking to Julie last night at the house and uh, Grant, we, we were sitting there together. And uh, the question, the thought of the second coming came up. And we began to discuss the second coming. And, and the question was asked, uh, Brent, how, how long do you think before the Lord comes? And I said, I cannot give you an answer because the Bible says that only God knows the day and the hour. But I can tell you this, I believe with all my heart and, and I honestly believe this if it's not in my lifetime which I personally believe it will be but if it's not in my lifetime I do not see how it cannot be in my children's lifetime one generation, I believe, I believe we are rapidly, the, the, the world that we live in is so fundamentally changing that I believe the Lord is preparing us for the, for the signs of his coming. You say, preacher, do you believe the church will go through the, the, the tribulation? I do not believe that. I believe that we rapture now. But I do believe that things will be precipitately worse and worse leading up to that time of the great tribulation. 
And the Bible does make this statement, Brother Barry. He says, when you see these things come to pass, we're to lift up our head. Our redemption draweth nigh. Dear friend, there are only a few pieces left in the puzzle that have to be put in place. And mark this now. This is why I believe we're so close. China, spoken of in end time prophecy as a major world force, is now moving to speak peace. The Bible says beware of them that come in the name of peace and safety. China, not war, but peace. The peace brokerage that China just made happen between the Middle Eastern nations is a huge step. And now they're moving into other parts of the world to to bring peace You say, well, well, America's always been the force. Somehow America must be taken off the scene because we are not mentioned in biblical prophecy and these other nations are. You say, preacher, what's happening? America is becoming a shell of what she once was. We're more concerned with with all these silly issues, these, these wicked, perverse, perverted things than being a nation. I said that to say this, it's time for some of you to say yes. You have budded your way through your Christian life. God has spoken, God has spoken, God has spoken. And you've said, but, but, but. And you keep giving excuses, just like Moses does. I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. They won't believe. He wasn't even excusing himself. Now, he was excusing the nation of Israel. They won't follow me. And God said, what do you got, Moses? A rod. Number one, I want you to notice what I believe to be a concerning objection. He said, Lord, I've already tried to lead the people once. I went out and killed a man. They saw it. They didn't like it. They ran me out of town. They're not going to believe me this time. Chapter 4, verse 1, he said, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe that, that you spoke to me. They'd have no faith in Moses. They'd have no faith to follow him. Can I ask you a question, just just a simple question? How do you know what someone else will do? You don't have insight into their thought. You don't have insight into their, their world. All you're doing is you are pushing your fear, you're pushing your lack of faith on other people. That's why you don't witness. They're not going to leave. You're presupposing what you do not know to be true. You don't invite people to church. Well, they're not going to come. You're presupposing your own fear, your own lack of faith. You don't know what's going to be, uh, ha- what, you don't know what's happening in their life. You don't know what their response is going to be. You are saying, because of my fear, they will not. It's amazing to me how that so many people are looking for answers. They're looking for someone to say, I know truth. And yet the people with truth are not giving truth because we fear they won't believe. We don't know what they'll say. It's a natural objection, a concerning objection. What about the people? Do you know that God is not near as concerned with their response as he is with your response? Moses, this isn't about the nation of Israel. This is about what they're going to say. Moses, this is about you. When I was 22 years old, the Lord finally broke through my defenses and, and all of my budding and all of my objection. And he said, Brent, this is not about John Stansel. This is not about Brenda Stansel. This is not about Curtis Hudson. This is not about anybody else. This is about you and me. But, 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 what about them? What about, no, it's not about anybody but you. Stop budding about them and deal with you. Church is not about the masses. Church is about the individual. I'm preaching to the hundreds, but I'm dealing with the one. And God is tired. Now listen, I'm tired, and I'm just human, so you you definitely don't relate to what I feel. But I know if I'm tired of excuses, how much more is God Hey, we need some folks to do this, but. Hey, we want to start this, but. Hey, hey, there's a need here that we could really impact the world for Christ. And instead of saying, okay, let's try it or let's attempt it, we hear all the reasons why it can't be done. 
And we hear all the reasons why you can't be the one to do it. Hey, let's try this, but. But my mama, my daddy, I was preaching this week, and by the way, thank you for praying. I was preaching revival in North Carolina, and uh, this church that I'm preaching at has a very large contingency of foster kids. A lot of foster kids, very troubled foster kids. And the Lord just really gave me some great grace, Stephen, to, to talk to them and, and to preach to them and then to speak to them before and after the services. And I, I, I preached a little bit along the, the lines of Psalm 68 that the Lord puts the solitary in families. And I said, your biological family may be a mess and, and, and you may not have a family that, that, that really has been good for you and the situation may very, uh, be very difficult. I said, but, but God wants to use you and, and God wants to speak to you and, and God wants to do something with you. And I pulled three or four of the young ladies aside after a service one night and I looked them in the eyes and I said, listen, it doesn't matter your past. God wants to do something great in your future but I'm going to tell you <clears throat> if those kids want to give excuses they got them Whew. they got them and by the way so do you I could start right here with Stephen and go all the way to the back of the room and you could give me a valid excuse of why it's not really your it's not really my it, it, you, know, you know, preacher, I get it, and I, boy, I, boy, the world and the laws in Pinellas County, but valid, real, justifiable. Isn't it interesting that we can justify the reasons why we don't? It's a concerning objection. And so then God said, let's look at a common object. What's in your hand, Moses? It's an interesting response, don't you think? He didn't say, Moses, I'm tired of you telling me you can't do this. I'm tired of you saying no. We've been arguing about this for two chapters now. It's not what he said. He, he didn't get on him. He didn't yell at him. He didn't tell him his lack of faith and, and his lack of trust. He just said, Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses, I mean, I'm just imagining this. You can imagine however you want to. Uh, we've already gone through the take off your shoes, holy ground. So Moses is standing there barefoot. The, the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ is speaking to him. The bush is consumed with fire but not going away. It's just a, a, ra a, ra a raging fire here. And the bush is still burning, uh, still, still living. And, and uh, Moses is talking to the Lord. Lord, and uh, he's saying, but, 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 and God said, what do you got in your hand? And Moses like, what? This? It's a, it's a staff, it's a rod, it's a stick, it's a, Lord, you know, it's a shepherd's crook. Here's what's happening with you, and, and I'm, I'm preaching pointedly this morning because I don't think we have a lot of time to beat around the bush anymore. This idea that we're going to slow walk you in, it ain't working for some of you. So the Lord just says, Moses, what do you got? I got a stick. But I want you to take that stick, Moses. I want you to throw it on the ground. Moses is looking at that stick and he's like, what? Now you say, what, 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 what was the stick? Well, obviously it's the rod of a shepherd. It was used for him to, uh, to tend the sheep. Now some people say that when he goes to Pharaoh and he has this rod, that it wasn't the shepherd's rod because, again, a shepherd would, would be something that the Egyptians would look down upon. They say it might have been the rod of a, of a ruler because have you ever seen a ruler with a scepter? And even, even high-profile people would have a stick. You, you see in the old pictures that the, the rulers would have a stick. Uh, but I don't know that, that Moses would have a stick like that. It could have been as simple as a walking stick by the time he gets to Pharaoh. But it's a common, ordinary thing. Something that everybody could get. A pharaoh could have a stick. A shepherd could have a stick. Hey, a little boy in the woods could have a stick. It's just a stick. Some are nicer. Some are more ornate. Some have different needs. Uh, an ox goat, by the way, it would have a pointy stick on one eye, and it would have a flat uh, place on the other. The flat place was to clean off the hooves. The sharp stick on the end was to goad the oxen. Uh, it's just a simple thing. Everybody could have one. And by the way, what do you got in your hand? I ain't got much. Oh, you're just a simple person. You're just a common person. You know that God uses common, simple people every day? Go through your Bible. Go through your Bible, and you're going to find there was a man named Shamgar. Shamgar had to deal with some enemies of God. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have a spear. He had what I mentioned ago, a minute ago, an ox goat. He just had a sharp stick, and he used that to defeat the enemy of God. Shamgar had an ox goat. 
The Philistines come on Samson, and Samson's got to deal with the Philistines. He didn't have a sword. He, he didn't have a spear. Uh, Samson, all he had was the jawbone of a donkey. The Bible uses a different word, by the way. We can't use that word because y'all would all giggle. Told you. Jawbone of a donkey. He took up that jawbone, and he just whipped the Philistines with it. I mean, there's a lot of ways to die, but being beat to death with the jawbone of a donkey, I'm not sure that's a good way to die. <clears throat> I have a couple of jokes here the old timers used to use, but for the sake of discretion, I'll leave them alone. I've been beat with some jawbones donkeys myself, but it wasn't the dead one. Jawbone of a don donkey. Ox goat of Shamgar. David had to go fight this giant Goliath, and, and Saul said, man, uh, you got to put on my arm, or you got to get my sword. And David said, I haven't proved these things. I don't know that they'll work, but I do know this sling that I carry works. And he goes down, he picks up five smooth stones out of the brook. He takes one of those simple little rocks, just a, a common, ordinary thing, something you see a billion times over, puts the, the rock in the sling, and round and round it goes, and up in the air, and it smacked the giant. And you say, well, preacher, the velocity of the rock was coming this way into the giant's head but the Bible says that he fell forward it's because as the rock hit him this way the power of God hit him this way it's a simple thing a rock my wife grew up in the country of Haiti one of the great pastimes of Haiti is rock throwing you say why because there's a billion rocks in Haiti everywhere you go it's just rock 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 and so the kids would just chunk rocks at each other little boy in the Bible took a lunch to hear Jesus speak. I like the idea that you preach so long you need a lunch. I didn't get one amen out of that, man. I was hoping to get an amen. Little boy had one lunch. It was a couple of little fishes and there was a couple of little pieces of bread. And there, there's 5,000 men plus the women and children, upwards of 20,000 people. And they said, we don't have anything to feed these people but this little lunch. And the Lord said, that's enough. And by the way, we're not talking some giant fish here. We're talking little Sardine-like fish makes the miracle even more impressive. It's a common thing. Here's your problem, and I don't want to bust your burble, but you, you grew up being told you're exceptional. You're not. You grew up saying you're special. You're not. You deserve the best. You don't. That's all a bunch of hooey. You're not special. You don't deserve anything. You're common. You're ordinary. Life hits you like it hits everybody else. Life is life no matter who you are. You don't deserve anything more than just to have the chance to live. And here's the wonderful thing. God's not looking for special. God's not looking for amazing. God's looking for common, ordinary. You say, oh, Brother Brent, my story, it's a common story, but it's a story God wants to use. My situation, it's a situation that others have been through, but God wants to use. Oh, if you only knew, if you only knew what I know, you'd be thankful that you have what you have because I would show you others that would trade places with you in a heartbeat. Nobody, I'm not anything. I'm zero, nothing. But 33 years ago, I said, Lord, whatever you want. And God is desperately trying to show you this morning, and God has been trying to show you for a long time, and you keep saying, but, 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 my past, my situation, my mistakes, my sin. And God said, I don't care about any of that. What do you have right now? just got a stick it's nothing it is what God wants to use but you keep telling God you don't have anything and yet you have everything you need for God to do something with you it's a common objection it's a common object it's a confusing order what do you got a stick throw it away what you just asked me what I have now throw it down and so he threw it down God's going to ask you to take what you've got and give it to him. 
but I ain't got a lot. Give it to me. That little boy, can you imagine a little boy in, in Luke? I've got two loaves, I've got a few fish, I've got, uh, I got a, a couple of fishes, a few loaves here, and uh, give it to you because they're talking about feeding all these people. Uh, are you a little bit, you've been out in the sun too long, Jesus. This ain't going to go anywhere. This barely feeds me. I'm a little boy. You're talking about men and women and children by the masses. This is a little confusing. Common objects in your hand are not impressive. Common objects in his hand can do unbelievable things. You, you keep your commonality and you'll just live a common life and make no difference. But you take your common thing and you obey God and you do what God says and you lay yourself on the altar and you say, Lord, here's my life. Use it as you will. And God then can take a common thing, a something that no one else sees value thing, and God can do incredible, abundantly above all you can ask things. Throw it down. Pick it up. First part I get. The second part, uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh. Don't pick it up. Now there's there's typology here, there's pictures here. They they say that the Pharaoh would wear a cobra as his main centerpiece, that great large snake that's very common in uh, India and other areas. And that cobra represented the power of Pharaoh, the power of Ra, the great god of Egypt. And uh, some would say the snake became, uh, the snake that, that was, was a cobra. We have no idea what kind of snake it was. We just know it was a serpent. It could have been a very deadly serpent. We have no idea. But I'm not picking up anything. And Moses, who had ran away when the rod became a snake, he had ran away and, and he said, I don't want nothing to do with that. God said, go pick it up. You just asked me to throw it down, it becomes a snake. Now you want to pick it up. Make up your mind, God. God wants to take and use you. Stop trying to figure out how. This is why some of your butts get in the way. Well, God, I would serve you if you show me exactly how this is going to work out. God, I'll serve you if you guarantee I'm not going to have hard times. God, I'll serve. God is never going to show you the end because it would scare you to death. He only shows you what's next. And God's going to confuse you. All right, let me ask you this question, and I hate to ask it because it's it's a monster. I already know the answer, but I have to ask it. How many of your life hasn't gone like you thought it was going to go? Let me see your hand. If you haven't raised your hand yet, you haven't lived long enough yet. You say, but God, I I didn't want to be here. This isn't what I wanted. Just throw it down and trust him. I tell people all the time, I want you to get this. This is... One of the great truths the Lord has spoken to me. doesn't matter how you got here. What's in your hand now? doesn't matter how you got here. What do you got now? The same pain, the same problems, the same difficulties, all the things that you think are the most awful things in the world. Do you understand this? Do you see how big God is? The same pain, the same hurt, the same failure, the same mistakes, the same frustration, all the dumb things you've ever done, All of that, it doesn't matter what's in your hand right now. All that matters in your life is not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's right now. What do you have in your hand right now? God wants to use you now. Don't worry about yesterday. Don't worry about tomorrow. What's in your hand right now? Just trust him. Be faithful. Throw it down. Pick it up. Let God use you now. But you got to follow the instructions. I don't see how me doing this is going to help. I'm hurt. I'm mad. I'm angry. I don't know how it works either. I just know when we follow the recipe, we get the right results. I don't understand how the Scripture works. I don't understand how the Holy Spirit works. I don't understand how God works. I just know this. When we follow the Word of God, He brings things to pass as He sees fit. I don't have to know the how. I just thank God I get to follow the instructions. 
confirming obedience. Now notice the point of all this. Verse 1, they're not going to believe. Verses 2, 3, and 4, it's all about Moses. What do you got? Throw it down, pick it up. But really, verses 2, 3, and 4 were to answer the question of verse 1. And he says in verse number 5, he says this. He says that they, who? The children of Israel. The Jews in captivity, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. It's a confirming obedience. Moses, your faith is going to lead their faith. Now watch me, listen to me. Your faith, your obedience is what God is going to use to impact others. If you never follow through with faith, you're never going to impact others because it's your faith that God sees. You know, the Bible says that the Lord uses the common things to confound the mighty. If you've got all the talent, all the ability, all the gifts in the world, by the way, God can use all of that in his hand when you yield to him. But, but if you do that, some people say, well, that's just your gifts, your talent, your ability, your natural born, your natural given things. But when God uses the untalented, the unequipped, uh, the untrained, the common, then God gets all the glory. And the Bible says that he loves to use the common things to confound those with gifts and talents. Why? Because that is impactful because that is where God can use anybody to do something wonderful and it is for his glory alone. Your life, common, but used in the hand of God, impacts others. Your faith, your obedience impacts others. Your faith, your obedience influences others to follow. Moses if, if we go back and we read our study and we notice the conversation that we'll have in a moment with Aaron, what's going to happen is that Moses is going to speak to God and God is going to speak to Moses and Moses is going to speak to Pharaoh for God, but God is going to use Moses to speak to Aaron, to speak to the people. It is the faith of Moses that will influence Aaron, that will influence the people, and it is your faith, it is your obedience that influences others for Christ's sake. You're, you're, you're not going to live a selfish life and be right with God. Your life is to be used to influence others. And you've had pain and you've had sorrow and you've had disappointment and you have difficulty. Guess what? There's eight and a half people, uh, eight and a half billion people that are just like you. And when you say, hey, God has been faithful and God has seen me through and God has brought me on the other side. What God has done for me, God will do for you. Your pain, your hurt, your problems, it is to be used to influence others for Christ's sake in the gospel. Your faith, your obedience inspires others that says, if God does it for them, God will do it for me. I tell our story often. I, I have no other story to tell. My mother was raised by alcoholics. My father was raised by an alcoholic daddy when he was around, which wasn't much. You say, oh, my past. God moves into my parents' life, 14, 16 years of age. My life comes, disappointments happen. You say, well, you're special, common. I was preaching this week up in North Carolina. I preached as I preached. All, I, I, don't, I don't preach any different there than I do here. And I was preaching the way I do, and I talked about how that God uses the worst mistakes of your life. After the service, an older, sweet woman, I picked on her all week long. She comes up, she's just bawling, 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 bawling. And she said, preacher, she said, this happened to me, and she told me what had happened. She said, you know, the Lord used that for 14 years. I worked in a women's, uh, women's ministry to help others because of the decisions I made here and God saving me and God forgiving me. She said, I took those pains and hurts and I, I went for 14 years I served in a women's ministry every day of my life helping others you know what Chris did her name is Chris she's a precious woman you know what Chris did she took what was in her hand and she used it uh, you know last night you'd have been amazed Matt and I went down to the Vinoy hotel hottie Hi there. 
big fundraiser for the hospital. CEO of All Children's Hospital, her name is Alicia. A Tampa Bay Buccaneer football player. Movers and shakers of St. Pete's financial world. Doctors, surgeons. Here's little Maya Stancil. Here's Miss Valerie. Here's Brent telling our story. After the part that we had went over to the table of the CEO, John Hopkins, All Children Hospital, she said, Maya, she grabbed her, pulled her up in her lap. She said, we love you. She said, this is my mommy. And my mommy knows your story from Indiana. And the, the mama, uh, the, 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 the lady's mama, she said, uh, she said to Miss Valerie, she said, oh, Maya's famous all over Indiana. I tell everybody about Maya. Now look at me. Listen to me. For three years, I watched my daughter fight life or death battles every day. Three days out of that three years, it was probable she would die. Machines kept her alive. And she preacher, you want to go through that again? Dear friend, never. And I don't want none of you to go through it. But it's what is in our hand. And we use it. And when we talk about the Lord, we say these things. Man, we thank God for our surgeons. And we call them out. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Q, AK. All. We thank God for our team. Thank God for our nurses. But we know our God is the God who gives all healing. And it was God who provided the perfect rainbow unicorn heart. It's what's in our hand. I don't want it. I want my daughter to be like your kids. Well, not some of your kids. After watching Quincy there night, I'm, I'm not sure, Quincy, that that was the perfect performance. But I'm saying I don't want that for my family. I don't want that for my, my daughter. I, I, don't, I don't like the fact that every time I look at her chest, there's massive scars down the front where there's been two hearts put in there. But it's what's in our hand. And I can't undo it. And I can't wish it away. And I can't change the past. So you know what I can do? I can throw it down. And I can pick it up. And I can say, Lord, use our life. The divorce, when the divorce happened in our life, it was the worst thing that ever happened. And I don't like it. And I wish even now it was not there. But I've been able to take that and tell others, hey, don't. I told, I told two boys this week. I pulled them aside. And, and, and I said, boys, two things you need to know. Don't blame God. That wasn't God's business. And I said, number two, don't help God. My, my issue in, in, in my situation growing up, I didn't blame God. God didn't have anything to do with it. But what I did was I helped God. And I said, well, if daddy and mama couldn't make it, I can't make it. And so, Lord, I'm not going to embarrass you uh, by being a good Christian, uh, being a pastor, being a, a minister. I'm just going to become a reprobate early. The logic of a 19-year-old is brilliant. I'll just become a drunk early. So there'll be no disappointment. Didn't that make sense to you? There's no disappointment. I'm just a drunk already. I'm just a rep. I'm a, I'm a whoremonger now. I mean, can't get any more disappointing than that. I'm not going to fall. I'm already at the bottom. And the Lord said, Brent, I'm not going to hold you responsible for anybody else but you. And so it happened. I can't undo it. It's what's in my hand. How many young people have I preached to over the last 33 years and said, hey, children of parents that have been down this road, ministry parents specifically, let me tell you something. God still has a purpose for you. It's what's in my hand. I think about this dear lady in the wheelchair here. I'm not in a wheelchair. Very few others are in a wheelchair. It's what's in her hand. I think about Glenda, our dear, most precious, wonderful friend. I hate it. God knows I hate it. I, I weep and grieve on a daily basis, but it's what's in our hand. Mike, it's what's in our hand. I, I ain't got nothing else. It's just what's in our hand. And, and some of you this morning, God is really desperately trying to get you to do something. To see, some of you need to be saved. You're lost and on your way to hell, and you know it. And you keep saying, but, but, but. 
You just need to surrender to him and say, Lord, I believe. But those of you that are saved, you, you've been given excuses, some of you for decades now. I'm not talking days, weeks, months. I'm talking some of them for years and decades. You've been budding every time God says something. And you give all the excuses why you can't. You don't actually see what God's trying to do. He's trying to take what you have. All your excuses, it's actually what he's trying to use. What's in your hand this morning? Oh, preacher, this is terrible. It's what's in your hand. Go find somebody else and say, hey, God's used this in my life. Hey, God's taught me some things. I've been there. I've done that. I bought the T-shirt. Might as well tell you about it and let you know that God's been faithful. God's been good. What's in your hand, Moses? If we all took what was in our hand and we let God use it, he could take a bunch of uncommon I mean, a bunch of very common, ordinary, nothing special people and do incredible things. Kaylee's got a beautiful voice. She sang this morning. How many young people could be used of God but? What she has, her voice, use it. Play the guitar, play the instruments, use it. Drive a bus, work a bus route, teach a Sunday school class, use it. Be a parking lot guy. Man, I got the best parking lot guys in the world. I got a bunch of hippies in the parking lot. Praise God. I love it, man. I I, I drive up in the morning. I see my parking lot hippies. I'm like, you know what? That's what they got. Use it. Use it. Use it. This morning, why don't you let God use it? He's telling some of you, throw it down, pick it up. And you're saying, what? He's just going to use you if you'll let him. Now, Lord, I pray as Tim comes. Save the lost. Desperately this morning, desperately this morning, would you please help people by the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome all of their objections and just realize that what they have, where they are, who they are, who they are, a product of all their past, all their pain, all their choices, it's what's in their hand. It's what they have to give. It's what they have to be used. Heads are bowed this morning, eyes are closed. I'm going to open the invitation. If you need to come, you can make your way to the altar even as we speak. But if God is speaking to you this morning, and you're looking at your hands and you say, man, I don't have anything but a common, ordinary life. Can I tell you that that's just the life God wants to use? God wants to use you just as you are. Just as you are. John Newton, you know what he had? He had a slave background. As a slave, as a slave trader. You know what John Newton did? He used what was in his hand to preach the gospel. And then to pen one of the great songs of the faith. It was, it, man, don't you think sometimes he was embarrassed as a slaver? And yet it's what it was in his hand. Can't change it, but you can use it. Your past, your choices, your decisions. Let me ask you this question. How about today? How about today, those of you that are unsaved, you don't know Christ as your Savior. If you were to die today, you don't know for sure you'd go to heaven. How about today? would be the day that you would come just as you are without one plea just here I am Lord and by faith believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross was buried and rose again that you might have everlasting life why don't you come today and be saved why don't you come today and be saved If I step out, come down to the front, would you just meet me and let us take a Bible and show you how to be saved? You've been waiting for quite some time for whatever reason, whatever issue, but you know that you need to be saved today. Christian, you you got a lot going on and you've given excuses after excuses. Would you please stop? Just stop 
and say, I'm going to use my life, just what I have, what's in my hand. Let's stand to our feet. Heads are but eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning you do a great work. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd save my friends that are lost and help those that are saved to bring what's in their hand and say, Lord, use me. Use me. In Jesus' name, Tim begins to sing. You step out of your place, you come. Use the altar. You step out of your place, you come. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. Today, Lord, every spiritual decision I give is a day decision. myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender. We don't. We, we never. We never draw out an invitation here. It's just not who we are. God speaks, you respond. That's what you're supposed to do. But folks are praying. We're going to give them time to pray. So that means God's still speaking. All to Jesus, you step out. I surrender. Humble all yourself. Surrender yourself. His feet. Let God I take you just as you are and save you. Worldly pleasures you. all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. I surrender all. I surrender. Let's sing now together.